Hello and welcome to Campfire Conversations, stories from the center of the universe, where we bring the stories from our campfire to your ears, wherever you are in the world. Here we chat to friends over a favorite drink, enjoy the crackle of the fire, and let the real stories of life in the bush be told. Let's get talking to some bushveld legends and hear about their finest hours, the moments that made them question it all and what keeps them coming back for more. Tonight's drinks of choice are gin and tonic and pineapple beer, because even though lockdown finished, we still love it. Let me introduce my special guests and friends one at a time. First up today, the famous Taylor McCurdy. At Tay McCurdy, at Taylor in real life. There's a couple of underscores there, you can find in the links below. She is literally famous on social media. Oh God. Born in Port Elizabeth, her father was a fearsome fast bowler from Australia, Rod McCurdy. Her mother, Bossy Donna, is also famous on Instagram. She is going to murder you. Taylor, she's going to be happy. Has TV presenting horses in her blood. She trained at Ulovani in the Eastern Cape, a place I hold dear to my heart and people too. She gigged and still does for Safari Live in the Sabi Sand and Masa Mara covering the Great Migration. She's currently with Eco Training as a guide, training instructor and presenter for Safari Live. She did stints at the world famous Sabi Sabi Game Reserve and also at Anabezi in Zambia. Taylor is a wildlife adventurer, private safari guide and photographer. She says, I live to entertain and educate people on the wonderful fauna and flora that Africa has. Nature has a comical side to it and I strive to show the world how I see it. I've worked all over Africa and more recently South Asia in Sri Lanka. I've also been a part of a live safari show which aired on Nat Geo Wild for over two years. Taylor is a great ambassador for guides, both male and female, for enthusiasm and entertainment. She's a whole load of fun. There is never a dull moment. She appears all over the general internet world, including the Daily Mail latest sightings. She's a brand ambassador. Can and we, we comment on how red she is? Today, <laughs> like this is a podcast. Just question. Yes. Was, did you just quote my LinkedIn profile yes, description? I did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Taylor, I did. Thank goodness. Because otherwise you're quite mysterious, but that's true. <laughs> Let's start with your... She appears on Go Nomad, Zambia's superwoman working in the wild. Uh, this one I also like. Big cat caught an enormous barbel from a small pool filled with fish. And then the hornbills. I mean, I'll let it ta you take it from there, but, but I, I'm keen to for you... Can tell us about those sightings, obviously, that are... Those ones, okay. The Hornball one has been pretty famous. Yeah. On the, well, not, it's it's obviously gained a lot of traction in the last month. Yeah, I've had a lot of people send it to me. It's done its second viral stint. It went viral about, I think it was about two years ago or so now. Um, Backstory to that. And I, I can't tell a short story, so sorry. Apologies in advance. Can we have um, another drink? My middle <laughs> name is actually long-winded, so. Um, so basically, what happened was on, on Wild Earth's show, Safari Live, oh, I'd been driving around and had one of those days where every time I had to go live, everything flew away, walked away, ran away, flew away. And it was a bit of a nightmare. And I, I think that day I decided that I was going to resign because I just had enough. And then the director said to me that they have to come to me because they've lost all the other fees and there's nobody else to go to. And I s cried, basically, and said, I can't. I can't present. I cannot do it. I can't go live. And then they sort of said, crash cut, and came to me anyways. So wiped the tears from my face. No and way. very sarcastically said, oh, some mongoose. They'll probably run away. They didn't. <laughs> and then the whole thing unfolded. Yeah, it's it was amazing. In about 10 minutes of these little mongoose pups just 
feigning death. Yes. And I, I don't know, I suppose they were trying to play with the hornbill. They were really young. They could have only been a couple of weeks old to a, f a, few, a few months old or so. So that was quite funny and entertaining. I've never seen it. No one has ever witnessed it with dwarf mongoose. You've got or that. I was having a mental breakdown, I think. <laughs> Shame, I so didn't I know laughed. the background. This yeah. Is crazy. So I laughed and then I cried and then it's just, yeah. <laughs> and then you just carried on crying. And then you just carried on, what yeah. Is the, the video is called. Um, want to search for it um i what would just go mongoose, mongoose play or, yeah mongoose plays dead oh, yeah. or something like that yeah, yeah. i mean you can Very get creative cool. i'm not known for my way with words so you know i love it <laughs> okay tell us the crane takes on elephants that's also it's all over that yeah that was that was an interesting one um I, we actually had a, in kenya in the masamara it wasn't an uncommon sighting to see especially during nesting time um for those gray crown cranes in the marshy sections you can imagine elephants enjoying the the nice cool water on their feet feeding on the luscious vegetation so there were quite a few different um cranes scattered out protecting their nests so every time an elephant herd went past you would just see them stand up and have a heart attack but yeah, I had a couple of sightings. I had from a young bull to a female with a youngster come over and sort of hassle the birds. But they really did stand their ground. I was, I was quite impressed. Yeah, so that was that was pretty good. Um, and then I think there was the catfish one. Yeah, which for me is remarkable. Like something I always wanted to say. I think you guys were together, or am I, or am I wrong? I was with mm, Tristan. Just uh, uh, Addie's better half, yeah. yeah. Exactly. The one yeah. that doesn't know my backstory. No, that doesn't know what you studied. <laughs> <laughs> not, not to be fair, neither of us. But um, anyway, that, there's somebody in the background. We'll introduce you now. That was that was the best sighting no. I think I ever had in Kruger, and I've been going to Kruger ever since before I can remember. As a kid, as most South African um, safari fanatics do, they drag their children in into the Kruger National Park from the safety of their own car, where you can scream and cry, you know, and just put the windows up. So, so exactly. did that, and I have never had luck in Kruger. Actually, my favorite thing to do is to just drive around and with my windows down really slowly and just drive in the bush. So I don't really care if I see anything or not. It's very easy to please. And as well, went with a friend of ours who is absolutely besotted with leopards, mm -hmm. and you are not allowed to look at anything else. You drive past at a million miles. Okay, you don't. You drive the speed limit past everything else in the Kruger National Park. And... Uh, yeah, we came across this this leopard that was it was actually on the Mpungolo River. Okay. I think is that the right name for it? Is that right? Okay, cool. That would have been it's amazing. It's a nice drive that. It's beautiful. Yeah. I haven't done it since I was a kid near Shingwezi yeah. and um, late in the afternoon chasing the last bit of sun and obviously drying up pools of water. Was it last year? It must have been last year. I think so. And Combi. See the bird is go. Yeah, Ali and I, we are not. We, I didn't even bring my binoculars today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised you don't have yours on. Usually I do. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so yeah, so basically this le this male leopard came out of nowhere and decided he was going to try catch a fish. So that's hands down the best sighting I've ever had in Kruger. Really? Or, uh, just us, no one else. Viewed it from on top of the uh, embankment, looking down. So. Yeah, it was pretty inc incredible. Next day we went back and he was completely black. I actually joked and said, oh, there's a baboon sitting on the sandbank. It wasn't, it was the leopard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So that's, that's incredible. And th those photos also, because those photos, of the, so that that's leopard. Yeah, I mean, again, leopard, barbel, Kruger, and it'll come up with the <laughs> pictures are actually incredible. I actually, I think I didn't get any photos. I just sat and recorded. So the shutter that you can hear are two other people yeah. with really big cameras and just, you know, snapping away and I was like I'm videoing this yeah, you know yeah. and then obviously um Nadav from later sightings messaged me and he was like this is insane yeah um so yeah so on later sightings yeah and then so yeah I was like and I've heard people like it's a good way to get some footage out and for the world to see and I thought it was a pretty Absolutely. amazing sighting so yeah that was a that was a goodie yeah it was it's amazing what you can find on google hey yeah it is <laughs> Are you getting scared about what's next? No, I'm terrified. What else you found about me on Google? So, actually, okay, any other sightings that immediately come to mind in terms of just your general life in the bush? Um, oh, I was, yeah. What one do you want to add that I didn't maybe mention? Mm, uh, one sighting, sorry, I'm, I make weird sounds all the time. Um, so, uh, just a cool experience that I don't think anyone else will ever have the privilege to do um, is the time I got to spend in the Masai Mara with Wild Earth. That was pretty insane. With yeah. Firstly, with the camera equipment that we got to use, thermal cameras, amazing infrared systems. One night we were out, and I've, I've told the story so many times, we were babysitting the Pride Alliance. So basically, yeah. they were my characters. We had an upcoming TV show with Nat Geo, and I needed to film them. I needed to know when they were going to hunt, when they were going to drink water. 
when they were going to defecate next to the car. And we would sleep, when the lions would sleep, we would sleep. Otherwise, we were awake and following them pretty much the whole day. So this big pride of lions, known as the Olololos, um, I'm surprised I was able to say that after a gym. <laughs> Should have done that story first. And uh, anyway, so they were asleep, just relaxing, doing what lions do. In the next minute, we hear like the, this roaring in the distance coming closer to us and three big male lions came charging in. So the whole pride got up, then there was fighting and they were chasing a female around and then about, I don't know how many lions it were. It sounded like there were about 30 lions around the vehicle. There weren't, there must have been about 18 of them and all roared at the same time. Just when you think it couldn't get better than that, a herd of elephants charged in and we were just kind of sat there. We couldn't do anything, we couldn't go anywhere. And these Ellie's were just charging around lions, racing past the vehicle. It was, it was amazing because we filmed the whole thing in thermal, which yeah. was cool. So we just sat in complete darkness. Um, we started up on top of the roof of our Land Rover and very quickly got back inside. <laughs> so, because we used to sleep up on top under the stars, which yeah, was really epic. So, yeah, so that, that kind of, that was a nice moment. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. So, okay, one last before I move on to our next guest. So, is the Great Migration the spectacle that it's made out to be? Oh, I don't know. I no, think no, I'm not asking in a negative no, way. No, it's, it's quite macabre to sit there and watch thousands of animals cross a raging river filled with huge crocodiles, like the biggest crocodiles you've seen. Um, I mean, that and then where they, sometimes where they dive off the banks and fall and break their necks. It's not, a, it's not as nice as what I think all these um, film companies make it out to be. It's, it's quite intense watching it. Um, but it's a, it is an amazing spectacle to go and see. But the Masamara, I think, is even more beautiful out of season. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah. Tell, so us, tell us more about that. I, I, I just, yeah, the scenery is just to die for. You don't want to go at when the grass is too long because then you watch elephants disappear into it. But, no, I would definitely recommend going to see the migration. I mean, if you're, up for, if you're a photographer and you want action, you're not going to get any more action than that. The predators that come and live along the, along the river and literally just tear into everything that climbs out is yeah. is pretty spectacular. But there's there's so much more to that ecosystem. I mean, you know, than than just yeah. the just the migration. But it is pretty impressive. That I think that was one of the most amazing things to do is go up in a hot air balloon, which I highly recommend, um, especially when you go along the Mara River uh, from what's the one called again. Governors, governors, governors sorry, for a minute oh, I forgot governors. <laughs> no. um, camp, uh, they do the, I think they do the best balloon safaris because you go straight along and um, meander down along the Mara River uh, very early in the morning <coughs> and to see, you know, tens of thousands of zebra and wildebeest everywhere. It's, I've never been surrounded by so much wildlife. Yeah. Literally everywhere you look, there's something to see, which is pretty epic. No, that is amazing. Yeah. Thank you. No, thank you. You can have another sip now. <laughs> the Olololos. <laughs> the Ololololo, yeah. And the Mpongolo. So I know, you didn't give me a chance way. there with the easy words. <laughs> thank you, Tyler. Very cool. You've had some amazing items, actually. Mpongolo Trail is going to bring us on to our next guest for today. We have two more hiding in the background <coughs> and contributing to the conversation with the greatest of pleasure. Um... Today joining us is Brendan Pinar of Lofel Trails Co. or Africa Trails Co. Brendan is a highly qualified trails guide based in the Kruger National Park. He's a level 3 guide on the Fogasa system and an accomplished man tracker who specializes in the training of anti-poaching soldiers across the country. He has a master's degree in plant ecology as, and is an expert on dangerous game. Fortunate to have been raised in South Africa and Botswana. He values the concept and philosophy of wilderness. More so than I've ever seen, actually. A hyper-focus may ensue when unique birds and plants are located. He's obsessed with simplistic nature experiences and all about the interconnectedness of the natural environment. A trails guide, a mentor, and assessor. Brendan has been conducting multi-day trails in the Greater Kruger National Park for the past 17 years. He achieved the Field Guides Association of Southern Africa Professional Trails Guide Qualification and Fogasa Specialist Knowledge and Skills Qualifications for Dangerous Game and Birding, a combo very, very few people have. He's a qualified tracker level three. Are you, yeah, is that incorrect? No, that's correct. Um, yeah, because the tracker system goes according to your lowest qualification. So okay. the trailing is professional, but I still default back to the lowest. Um, I'm with you. Yeah. He is a mean tracker, the meanest I've ever seen. 
Brendan still actively conducts backpack trails in Kruger National Park, but has become passionate about facilitating primitive trails and trails guide courses for Lothal Trails Co. His relevant field experience includes more than 12,000 walking hours and over 100 Kruger Park trails, which is something to be very proud of. Brendan's calm nature and ability to interpret the interconnectedness of the natural environment makes him a popular trail leader. He deeply values the concept and philosophy of wilderness and associated attributes. From his wife, the beautiful <laughs> Tamsin Pinar, he was an all-round team sportsman. At school, he was good at everything, but then had to decide, so focused on rugby and water polo. Rugby as a wing, first team for both. He loves fly fishing, just not much time to do that these days. Brendan has got his master's from Wits University in plant ecology. He's passionate about writing, takes after his grandfather who used to write and create plays for theatrical performances. He's a very creative human being and all things wilderness. Brendan is so passionate about saving wild spaces. He is the best dad and husband. I get pretty emotional, to be honest. Yes, that's amazing. He grew up in Botswana with his mom from about grade four until his mom passed away in 2011. During high school, he bo boarded at Paul Ruiz High in Stellenbosch and lived with his grandparents on the weekend. Most of his classmates don't even know his real name and they know him as Bots or Botswana. And we do not know that in the Lothal. So that was good info. Brendan can track. He can teach and he can make fire from scratch. This is the man you want to get lost in the bush with. A friend, mentor, inspiration, and a good human being, of which we need more on this planet. Brendan is a ninja in the bush, and someone I most certainly look up to and look to for inspiration and leadership. Ladies and gentlemen, the great Brendan Pinar. Yes, that's an overwhelming introduction. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you. Brendan, um, let's start. So I talked about, so the, I mean, uh, I think one of the coolest things from my perspective about you, and there are many, is the 100 Kruger Trails. I mean, talk to us about the Kruger, about Kruger Trails. Take it where you want to go. Yeah, I, th I mean, that is, I think, also stands out as one of my um, happiest achievements. I think um, it's not so much for, for the number, but just the opportunity more than anything else. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the, the beautiful thing about Kruger... Um, and, and a lot of people overlook this, is that if you had to drive Kruger, like we've heard all these amazing v experiences and sightings that people have along, along the roads and in the camps or next to the camps. So if you had to drive all the roads in Kruger and take the average viewing distance on, on either side of the road, um, you know, you, you would only have seen about 3% of Kruger. Wow. So they've got a, a beautiful zonation structure in place yeah. and they structure their infrastructure and activities according to the zonation so it would go from relatively high impact all the way to the most pristine of environments which which would be designated wilderness areas so within these wilderness areas you are not allowed to have any grid network of roads so you can have a road going in and out but obviously there's no other tourism activities so it's a designated trail area um, there's close to 20 designated wilderness areas in Kruger and many of them ha host the traditional wilderness trails, you know, the seven wilderness trails that started in Kruger in the 70s. And then in 2000 and, uh, 2006, they decided to start with these backpack trails. And they started along the Olifants River, which is another designated uh, wilderness area. So it started off as a, geez, what is it, just over 50 kilometer hike along the river, which would take you about four days, so three nights out in the field. And then following on that, they, they created this Mpongol wilderness area, just at, uh, west of Shingwetsi, which is, according to me, probably the best of the three uh, just because of this vastness i think the isolation and the space that you get to to explore and, and and work with and then most recently they've started the lonely bull backpack trail which is 
along the Letaba River. So the Wellifants River Trail is a point A to point B type hike. So so you you have to cover X amount of distance every day to get to the end point. And I find the beauty about the Lonely Bull, but particularly the the Mpungol, with where you don't have any permanent water points, so to speak, uh, is just the the flexibility that it allows you. So you can go out with a general plan. You decide where you get dropped off. Just to give you know, for those that that are familiar with large spaces, it's the Mpungol area is 150,000 hectares. So that's larger than some of the sections. The Kruger is divided into 22 sections, management sections. So that's larger than some of the management sections. Well, it's three times some of these parts. That's there is. three times Pilansburg, if I'm not mistaken. Sure. Yeah. So that is just for you and your trails group. Yeah. And pretty much as, as you know, the, the, you play it as per the wind direction, as per the vocalization of the animals at night, the tracks that you find. So your only limiting factor out there is the midday sun, the heat, and obviously water. You need to get to water. That's that's priority. You know, I've done some walking outside of the Kruger proper, outside of these backpack trails, in the associated private nature reserve and in in Mozambique and you know in in Rwanda, and I just can't beat that the feeling I get when I when I go into these. Uh, areas in Kruger the you know this yes it's home it is yeah. it is what I'm familiar with but there's something there that is extremely powerful and I think all too often people write off Kruger saying it's too commercial mm -hmm. and they deny themselves the opportunity to have one of the last remaining wilderness experiences that that the country's got to offer so to speak so just in terms of access not the number in terms of, you know, the access and and the the opportunity to be able to go there, go back, is is quite phenomenal. Yes, achieving the 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 century is something, you know, that you you often look out for and you and you you enjoy working your way towards it and and so on. But it's it's more than that. It's just that opportunity to to spend time in that space. Yeah, I agree. I mean, then those are wise words. Those are awesome. The things about yeah, realizing what what kind of wilderness experience this is on some people's doorstep and two i just looked at it as if you've done 100 trails of three or four days that means for over a year of your life you have been on foot inside these wilderness areas of the kruger park i mean it's astounding you know you're the steve war of, 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 of trails guiding <laughs> it's nice i often compare it to test match yeah, uh, cricket test know, matches yeah steve <laughs> test matches, and that's, yeah. you know and, and i think yeah. You know, you and maybe other people don't get the credit for actually that is, yeah, that's the experience that you've gained of a year of your life doing doing that on on on, yeah. on point. Yeah. So I think if you if you work it out per night, it's hundred on the hundred and twenty second trail. I think it's the second night. Uh huh. Y it's a full year out in the field. So from there one January go. to thirty yep. first sure. December. Yep. Sure. Um, wow. Yeah. So that's that. You know. Is my next goal, yeah. um, but but apart from that, like I said, now I'm involved in other trails as well in Timbavati. Tell us, okay, so just yeah. tell us about uh, Lofal Trails Co. and Africa Trails Co. Yeah, I mean Lofal Trails Company was started by myself and and good friend Wayne Wayne Tabraka, and it's really just a an an extension and a natural progression of our passion for trails and these wild spaces that I that I speak of. So we started in 2006 and, you know, we just wanted to do trails locally. We wanted to, to get the community involved in trails and, and, and to be honest, we needed to generate, generate work for ourselves because we, we didn't have much going at that stage. Um, and, and one thing led to another and we started the, the Trails Guide courses and, um, you know, conducting these courses and training, which was something new for me. Wayne had training experience, but it was something that was new to me. 
And although I, I thrive off the energy that the, the students bring, you know, the excitement, I, I did have to work quite hard at that um, teaching. Uh, and, and what I realized that it, was, it, it wasn't a, a, a one-way flow. It was an interactive type experience. Mm -hmm. So you often think teaching, I'm going to tell you what to mm -hmm. do, right? But, but we're learning so much from the students Absolutely. and they're having to ask questions from a different angle and you know so that's been it's been challenging but rewarding um and and yeah we've been we've been going fairly strong in that trail primitive trail space and in the training space we do things in small groups we only ever have a maximum of eight people be it on trail or in camp to when we train and we've extended that into um uh, trails guide mentorship trails where we actually take trails guides onto these multi-day trail experiences because i you know we we believe that if you're going to be a trails guide you have to be familiar with what we consider to be a trail yep. you know multi-day trail so there's that early exposure and then we also ex expanded that and the whole um, field guides association uh, criteria for this trails qualification has now come to include a mentorship process so we act as mentors and and we've adapted uh, um, some of our products to be more like a workshop where people can actually come and walk be it lead or back up with us under our um, guidance i yep. suppose mentorship yep. um, so that they can log those core hours that's required for them to achieve achieve their qualification so it's extremely rewarding uh, challenging at times, um, both in field, but also, I um, you know, in field. But when you're in field, you're away from home. So you know, having a family, it, it does pose a challenge. And then actually, you know, the whole link, there was the the, the the man tracking. I went to Rwanda, in, geez, it was a f quite a few years ago now with um a, a counterinsurgency tracker training. Uh, Sean Patrick amongst them, Colin Patrick. Andreas Liebenberg, and we trained the 60-odd field rangers to um, to track rhinos because they were going to reintroduce black rhino into Akagira National Park, yes. but also um, to familiarize themselves with the tactical man tracking and the standard operational procedures. And through that process, got to meet the the, the warden of the reserve, the manager. And I said to him before I left, I had so much fun walking around there that, you know, I would, it was the perfect space for trails. And he said, okay, cool, I'll take your word for it. And then two years later, I got an email saying, hey, you still want to walk? <laughs> I'm like, oh, yes. <laughs> and um, I went back and we set up a, a five day trail through the park. Um, and you know with within african parks there were some connections of people that wanted to come walk and so on so i went up um sort of surveyed and laid out the trail and since 2017 we've been running these trails running them commercially between august and october which is a very small window between two rainy seasons and a fire season so we've got a small window but nevertheless we established africa trails company um and we work within Akagera National Park, which is part of the Africa Parks Network. So this is basically a pilot or a pioneering project. And we have our fingers crossed that, you know, more space within their network will open up soon for, for uh, you know, alternative destinations or for more backpack trails. Super exciting. Yeah, very, very exciting. Yeah, I mean, I, so I'll just, I mean, while I've got the opportunity, I'll just say, you know, I've always been a huge... Uh, a fan of the brand i really have you know this is a very strong brand you guys have got some i got my hat on i got my truck a local trails app <laughs> you guys have got some actually very cool presence on social media brendan creates some very very cool articles on linkedin which i've enjoyed of late uh, excellent content on youtube also uh, some clips that you've created recently and your branded items i mean there's lots of cool local trail stuff that people can go check out including your fillies are those what you're wearing now yes they i'm wearing them in. I'm pretty jealous, they're still I'm a saying. bit tight nobody <laughs> wanted to make me branded fillies mm. you should be proud of that it's a cool story um if we have time it's made by sapmark 
Yes. And we met Some the guys. Yeah, you know, we get we got, got to meet the guys from Sapmark, two yes. friends. So um, immediately we related to them because Wayne and myself are good friends and we're in business. Same with them, and they they believe in leather only, no synthetics. Well, at least in the upper. And uh, they when they were kids, they had this code language, you know, and and they they Afrikaans boys, and they spelt everything backwards. So when they got into business and they started making feldskun, they you know they, they they were keen on adventure and so on and so they said like what do you need for an adventure well you need a you need a compass and then they said hey remember our secret code yes. let's call it sapmok <laughs> so that's where the name comes I from did not know that, yeah cool. very cool yeah. um and yeah so so they they approached us and gave us a pair of their standard fellies and we wore them over a couple of seasons and said okay well maybe modify that or change that or that didn't work so basically they've built our you know our perfect trail shoe and now we're selling them yeah Super so cool. that's that's very you check cool. it out on your website absolutely yeah, yeah. so the website we're launching an online shop okay, um cool. probably at the end of the week good so you can do that do we get discount for being here with you yes no. <laughs> yes <laughs> 100%. Mm. let's uh let's take a little one one minute anybody wants a loo let's charge our glasses uh, and then we'll hit it again. How are we doing on the 1606? We've got an hour, that's awesome. I'll um. start with... <coughs> Off we go. Our third guest this evening <coughs> is Ali Olivieri. Well done. Uh, Nailed there. it. <laughs> nice. Ali is a BFF of Taylor who's entertaining us tonight and has a company called Wandering Through who you need to go and check out. Half Venezuelan, half Italian. She was born in Caracas, Venezuela. Ali speaks Italian, Spanish, French and English fluently. Can speak bits of Latvian and Russian and can converse in Afrikaans and Shanghai. She has a master's in conservation science, a degree in the liberal arts and business management. Is a baker woman at a catering business. Is extremely well traveled. Her mother was a travel agent. Ali spent time at Lion Sands and Simbambili in the world famous Sabi Sand Game Reserve and did her thesis on leopards in Tanzania. Welcome. You are the most exotic South American we will ever have. <laughs> and it's good to have you here. Thank you. So thank you for being with us. And you've been sitting in the smoke the whole time. I mean, us South American are resilient people. What can I say? <laughs> what I want to know from you is, considering all of what I've said, why? Did you end up in Hutzberg? I mean, I don't know, to be <laughs> honest. <Anyone? laughs> uh, no, it's, I think it's one of those things where you can look at it. It's either a complete coincidence, complete fluke, or it was just meant to be from yeah. the beginning. Um, where I grew up in Venezuela, that's northern South America, we of course have the bush and stuff like that, but we don't have exotic things for us like rhinos and lions, but we have jaguars and pumas and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But there isn't that industry that structure that wilderness that they have in south africa or in general in africa and just going and exploring the natural areas and just spending time viewing wildlife and that kind of stuff so growing up in south america i mean nat geo or discovery channel and just looking at all those things was incredible and since i can remember i, I always said that i needed to come to africa to see the lions and the animals and everything else of course and then eventually I, I did all my studies back home and everything else. And then I went through a bit of a, an emotional crisis, let's call it that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm leaving. I'm going to go to Africa to volunteer. I'll be back in three months. And then I got here. Mm -hmm. And then I, and I actually volunteered in two wildlife rehab centers. One of them was here in Hootsbray, in Moholo Holo. Okay. And then I looked after a rhino in the first one that I was there. And I was like, okay, then I'm never going back. <laughs> I'm staying. They have rhinos. These are cool things. Yeah. I'm staying right here. And basically one thing just led to another and then this just felt like the right place for me because they had pretty much everything that I wanted to do and then I was like, I can get paid for taking people and showing them about the wilderness. I was like, no, <laughs> like I'd be stupid to go back home. That's awesome. And then, well, when I started in Moholo, it was interesting. It was a, a lot of hard work, but I learned a lot. I used to also work at a vet clinic back home, so I knew some of animal husbandry and that kind of stuff, but this is a whole new level. 
And then when I got here, I started hearing about my friends wanting to be guides. And then they were talking about trees and birds and things like that. And I was like, what is this industry you speak of? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I eventually heard about this course that they were running at Lion Sands, like a training course. And I was like, oh, well, I'm going to apply for that. Let's see how it goes. And then eventually, you know, I did it there. And then ever since, I've been pretty much enjoying the bush. So I don't know how it happened, but it just sort of all worked out in my favor in the end. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, um, I love it. Uh, so at the Moore Training College? Uh, it was, well, it was sort of the, the prequel of what it is uh -huh. now, the Moore Training College. They had a, we, I think we were the second course that they were running, and they were running it at Lion Sands uh -huh. River Lodge in the, sa the Sabi yeah. Sand. Yeah. And then we would do stuff with the Kruger National Park, because they also had another property there. And then we just did, it was a six months training. And then afterwards, they had like this, the most horrible drive I've ever taken in my life, <laughs> which was, of course, the assessment drive. <laughs> yeah. But I think I charmed them during those six months. And I was like, look at all the languages I can speak. You need to keep me. <laughs> and then eventually, you know, they were like, OK, cool, you can stay. And I was like, yes. <laughs> so pretty much ever since, like, I've just been in the in the industry and I cannot say I mean it's tough being so far away from home but I wouldn't change yeah. it for the world I love it so tell us uh, let's go then in the, the, the thesis um, so I know your relationship status with Taylor my uh, relationship status you know, what is your relationship status with Tristan actually I'm being serious now I think I might have he is my partner oh, but are you my engaged? life partner are you engaged do you see any f any rings no, no, okay so we're not even when i was right i didn't <laughs> yeah. get that wrong i'm like Gee. no 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 we can okay. give him we can give him some crab afterwards so yeah. <laughs> your boyfriend says you did something with crocodiles something with wild crocodiles and cowbells i might need to something rethink this relationship wild crocodiles. you do and i was like well this sounds interesting <laughs> whatever you did okay so um, it was actually a very cool project and I think it could have worked, but it was very poorly organized and I had a really bad experience in terms of sexual harassment and people that really didn't know what to do in the bush and I got very upset with the whole project and I ended up leaving. So basically the idea of the project was to try and see if you could train wild crocodiles to associate the ring of a cow's bell to a negative stimulus to then for them when they heard the cowbells instead of going and attacking for them because they know it's a cow and they can eat it for them to swim away and then attack less people, eat less cows and that kind of stuff. And I was doing it in Namibia. Okay. Um, but like I said, there were quite a few issues with the, with the study in itself. And then yeah. I eventually didn't end up doing that study. And then that's how I ended up swapping doing something else with camera traps in Tanzania, which was very yes. interesting. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to some of these. But tell us about the... Um, yeah, camera trap survey spot pattern identification in Ruaha. Yes, that's correct. So basically what happened is the poor man that had to supervise my thesis and now I went into a panic attack when I couldn't finish the crocodile stuff. Okay. So he had another student that was in Ruaha doing, I can't even remember what he was doing. He was doing something about predators in Ruaha and he had a bunch of camera traps set up. So basically the data that they weren't going to use, they, were, so they said to me, well, here's a bunch of data, just try to figure out what you can use from this to make a thesis so that you can graduate from your master's. Uh -huh. So I ended up studying uh, or um, comparing the reliability of citizen science. So when people take photos of animals and that kind of stuff, particularly for leopards, um, when compared to like a more traditional method to establish populations like camera trapping, you know, that you have a grid and then you see the animals and so on. And then you have to identify every single leopard by their spot pattern because they didn't have a program <laughs> that did that. I think Pantheria now has it for the Sabi Sand and stuff, and I'm sure that makes their lives easier. I, at one point, would close my eyes and just see spot patterns oh. <laughs> and just that kind of stuff. So it was long, but it was very interesting. Um, it was the very first study that ever gave the population size for leopards in Ruaha, and the density is comparable to the one in the sand, so very high density of leopards and everything. Obviously, not as relaxed as the ones that we have here, but some really cool ones up there. And it ended up being that, yeah, citizen science can actually be used to inform management decisions, at least in Ruaha, for, for how to manage leopard populations up there. Fantastic. Yeah, it was pretty interesting. That is. I so enjoyed just, it. I obviously have 
the, you know, okay, you can over and over see a leopard. I haven't got into it myself personally, but obviously people I've worked with on a daily basis can. You look at the spot pattern along the whisker line. Well, I couldn't do the whisker line. So normally Sorry. people like, oh, yeah, on Safari Live, like because you can see the face and they have this fancy cameras and zooms, people normally do the spot pattern on top of the whiskers. I couldn't do that because it's a camera trap. It's very pixelated image. And if you take it at night, you will not see the face of yes. that thing. So I was using the side profile. So on the body, the belly and that kind of stuff. And you were able to. Yeah, it's fair. Like if, because ideally what you do is you put the camera traps on both sides of a trail and you choose, mm -hmm. you don't put them in the bush in a random spot. You go and look for the places where you think the animal is going to walk. And then you get a, a, an image from both sides and then you are able to start comparing them. And if you get sort of their flank, then it's fairly easy because there are spots that are immediately speak to you like I could, at one point I was like okay cool this is this one this is this one this is this one and then it becomes easier and easier cool some, some of them are were a bit of an I don't think it's that easy because I've <laughs> never got it right it's well, not that easy well like if you if you have to look at them because yeah. your life is pending in the balance yeah. you will learn them <laughs> you're like okay this is that one no, ironically, there was one big male leopard that I think became sort of the star of that particular area in Ruaha because he had massive rosettes. He looked like a jaguar. I remember looking at these images and I was like, this is not a leopard. <laughs> this is a cat that got lost. And then I read somewhere on a blog that they actually called him Onsa for Panthera Onsa, which is the scientific yeah. name for jaguars. And then they were just calling him that because he did not look like he belonged there. So That's it's pretty cool. Very cool. He's still around. So you ever see him live? No, I haven't. Uh, I want cool to. Yeah. But uh, Taylor was actually going to go up on to Ruaha this year, and you know, but with all of this wonderful pandemic, we don't know if that's going to happen. Yeah. So I was going to be like, if you find him, carry my chicken bone for me. Yeah. <laughs> chicken bone. Sounds oh, interesting. What else are we going to give him? <laughs> we just, for the record, we don't condone feeding of wild animals. <laughs> it's a joke. It's a joke. <laughs> what? Do you joke? No. Okay. Be, so. <laughs> I, I want to get deep only for one, one, one set of questions, but you obviously, you know, the obvious question for you guys, and, and then you obviously mentioned sexual harassment. So there is a question uh, from our friend Carrie Hickman, and, and it's obviously something I've thought about and spoken to a few women about, but I mean, I don't want to get too deep, but have you, is it an, an issue to be a guide as a female? Like, I'd like to believe it's not, but you know, uh, there's no two ways about it. It's a macho um, industry. It's very male dominated. It's sometimes we as a stereotypical male guide, myself, maybe we are, are quite stereotypical in our views and quite conservative. Um, yes, I mean, Look, I don't I think I have to expand. I think it's, I mean, I don't know, Taylor, what your, your take. Yeah. I have had incidents of sexual harassment by male staff members at a lodge, be it guides, be it non-guides, because they don't believe that you are a guide as a girl. Yeah. Just because you wear a braid and you carry a rifle, it's just like, oh, you know, this is a joke or whatever the case. And also, I mean, I've had it from guests when they see a girl walking in and they're like, hi, my name's Ali, I'm going to be your guide. They look at you like, no. Yeah. <laughs> and then you, you have to sometimes work harder to prove yourself. But in that sense, I have also bumped into so many incredible men that do believe that a girl can be just as good as a guy or even better as a guide. And then I've met so many that have sort of mentored me, have helped me, have had my back. So I think it's a bit, it's not all negative. Of course, there's that side aspect of it. But with that, I've had so many positive, ex so many people that I consider my brothers yeah. that I've worked with that, you know, have been nothing but supportive. So it's a bit of a, you know, both ways. I don't know what your experiences and I see. think I was a little bit more susceptible to it when I was younger and very inexperienced I mean I started guiding at 19 so I had absolutely no idea about the big bad world out there and I was very privileged to grow up in a nice family where I never ever experienced anything like that I went to all girls school so it was never an issue for me so yeah I definitely um, faced a few challenges in the beginning of my career now I just don't stand for it at all mm. so some people might say I'm a bit blunt or uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, the upfront about it, but I'd rather just not be treated in a certain way. And, and so I just make it very clear. Um, but it is, it, 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 I think it is hard. Um, I, I don't think a lot of people do it on purpose all the time, but like Ali say, 90% of the wonderful men out there don't do it. it. There's just, like there is in everything, there's a few people that give a certain gender a bad name. 
but it's it's not it's not that bad but it will happen um mm. so yeah it's it is tough but you just got to be strong and stand what for was it the, what was the hardest thing so i think i mean uh, okay it's pretty obvious most people but 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 i mean it is it is tough out there you know a lot of the time we're all living together and there mm. are more boys than girls oh. um some of it is physical and sometimes maybe that's where boys always say girls can't do it i think there's two things i want to know one what is what was the hardest thing for you i've seen you in action you're amazing and and i no 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 and i've seen some female guides out there absolutely incredible we always say that the girls shoot better than the boys which is often what the boys have a lot to say about (laughs) and you know i've got friends who are literally the world's best photographic guides and 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 they're female so i've got no I think, so there's one thing, what was the hardest? And two, I mean, maybe from you, just to tell people, like young women who are 12, like it's it's a pretty cool job and, um, and you you can do it. Yeah, I, I think for me, honestly, one of the hardest things to do was changing a tire because yeah. I- It's bloody would, hard. No, it, it's, <laughs> I mean, me right it. now it's, we think of it and it's a, such a simple task, but yeah. like in the beginning, generally men are typically stronger than women. And when you're in that situation, when you're on your own and it's quite dangerous to get guests involved to change a tire because yeah. we all know how, um, how dangerous and sometimes not reliable high lift jacks can be. So you yeah, don't absolutely. ever want to put a guest in that position. Um, so I think that was the hardest thing. And I was never really taught any techniques on how to change a tire as the things that could, um, are ways for me to be able to do something like that. Uh, so only later in my career was I taught sort of some techniques that definitely help me that I don't have the upper body strength uh, that a man does. It doesn't matter how many push-ups I do or what not. I, I'm just not going to be strong enough. So those tips that were actually taught to me by, um, a, a, you know, a man that I really, um, you, th- you know, value in my guiding career and definitely mentored me and helped me. Um, he, he showed me how to do these things and I was like, oh my gosh, this is so much easier. So mm-hmm. now as a woman, I've passed those techniques on and with eco training, normally with the w- women that are on the courses, I say, come, let's go learn how to change tires because this helped me and I only learned it later on in my guiding mm-hmm. career and it would have been such a godsend to have known how to do this in the beginning. So that's something that I've noticed, something as simple as that, but it's one of the most important um, uh, things to be able to do in the bushes to success, to be able to look after your car, um, and then of course changing a tire. We know how many punctures we all get. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, that was one of the toughest things. Uh, even shooting was difficult in the mm. beginning, but now I seem to be okay with it. Well, we'll see. No, I'm joking. You can ask Massey. <laughs> I think I did fine. I did. I just, just, just for the record, I just recently passed my mm-hmm. RH. I'm okay. Maybe if if I can just add something there. You know, you're talking about the. Uh, the physical component, mm. you know, yes, generally speaking, males are more masculine, more physically physically stronger. But if I can take this to the trail space, mm-hmm. right, the offset there is that the advantage, rather, that the females have is with the soft skills. Mm. Mm. Okay, mm-hmm. so when you look at guiding, you look at, uh, I see it sort of like as three spheres, you know, like y- you get nature and then you get all your... You, you get your hard skills, and which you almost never use. Yeah. Um, think about shooting. How often do exactly. you actually, you know, how often do you actually have to shoot on? on hopefully not. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully never. Yeah. But be it as it may, you have to practice and you have to be competent. Mm-hmm. So it's there. It's a hard skill. And then you get your soft skills. All right. So your soft skills is, is leans more towards the feminine. So your hard skills more masculine. Yes. You, so, so what? You can change a tire. Out, in the, out on trail... Okay, when you when you're standing there, um, and you you know being confronted by an animal, we all equal, yeah. all of us, male, female, of course. big bank account, small bank account, it doesn't matter. That elephant doesn't care. Okay, so it's an equal playing field. So then, now all of a sudden you've got you know a partner from the confrontation, but in the space where you're facilitating an experience, that feminine, that soft skills. Um, that come from the female guides are generally far superior than any masculine um, uh, personality can can um, you know put forward. I agree. Totally. So in the trail space, you find that females, female guides, may very well be much better guides, facilitators. Yes. Let's call them facilitators because yeah. that's what it is. Uh, much better facilitators than any other male 
that wants to focus on the hard skills because um, the females will you know s concentrate on the, on the on the softer more festival more mm. social there's side and involved. nature there's no ego there's no cowboys that's that's yeah. the beauty and and for that reason yes it's more difficult to change the tire but on the trail mm. space by a long shot you're more competent at dealing with mm. the, the the interaction the facilitation and those soft skills those personal skills so it's much of a match i've seen some i've seen female guides being treated in it in terrible ways it's uh, it's unacceptable mm -hmm. um and, and and probably because people don't recognize these these facts but yeah. it's changing it's not yeah. yes. it's, 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 it's not completely yeah. different world i think from when ali and i first mm. started guiding yeah. and I, I think there's a lot more pro in i think large owners want women in camp just yeah. for an example i think our like you were saying our soft skills our attention to detail Definitely. again yeah. of course you get p everybody is different and we're all equal but i know that if i were to ever show a guest to their room i'd pick up if there was a stain on the carpet mm. or the pillows weren't fluffed or whatever the smallest thing is mm. and sort yeah. that problem out before and a complaint could even be laid with the necessary people whereas you know, maybe a guy walks in kind of doesn't notice something like that or the coffee cups haven't been replaced or i don't know what mm. it may be no i agree with that and also but with reading people i think from yeah. my experience Empathy. the last whatever mm. years that, that women are reading the guests better and in my experience i've seen guests be worse to the guides because they're female as in your story mm. than i have like as us as colleagues or just in my own experience you know i've seen the reaction and as you said the world has changed in the last 10 years and so has our industry but yeah, it's, it's, it is tough. I think you guys are awesome inspiration for women and, and, and so there's so much inspiration actually in the industry yeah. right now for young ladies and it's certainly a... But it's changed quite a lot, as Stella said, since we first started. I think in the world, like, it's more accepted and, well, when I was guiding in this, pr in, at Lion Sense, it was a big team. It was 15 guys. Yeah. I was the only female. Yeah. So not for lack of other girls not coming, but it was just not happening. Yeah. And now you, you look at, because obviously you know what to look for. You look at all the, the guiding um teams and you're like mm, how many girls have you got there and more yes. and more like you know there's at least one whereas before there there didn't used to be any look at who our mentors are now like mm. you or brett you and brendan i think you guys are very wo worldly exactly. and uh, there's a there's a very different um i suppose um person's perspective as to what a mentor should be now than what it was mm. 20 yeah. years ago sure. so i think like for exa example the two of you are very approachable and make it easy for young women to be successful in the industry and you come in feeling like an equal i don't think women in this day and age will have too many problems which is awesome because like you said yeah. it's yeah. always been a man's territory and it's nice that, that women are creeping in and that we're also allowed to enjoy the wilderness and uh, get to experience Absolutely. it with 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 um incredible men i mean yeah. how, how many people end up meeting their partners in the bush because they find they, they mm. find their soulmates yeah, so absolutely. like that's also well, that's ironically that's how tristan and i met i needed mentorship for trails hours because i needed to get my lead and i was like <laughs> i was yeah. a tick Have to you every lead yet are you still using him no i mean no, i'm, I'm still using him but <laughs> <laughs> no so that's exactly how it happened like everybody that was going on a walk i would be like can i please be your backup because <laughs> that was the you know the way yeah. it used to be when you had to like go with the mentor and then they would sign my hours and i'd be like it's like have you got lead trails no then i'm not interested and i would go to the next person and that's, that's awesome. how we became friends yeah, actually exactly. like we walked an elephant bull and that's the way it worked and then yeah. lucky him even if he doesn't know where i've been or what i've done <laughs> clearly <laughs> Don't blame him. I'm overrating. <laughs> well, my wife and I met at Lion Sands, actually. Did you? Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've worked out so far. Okay. <laughs> so so there's hope. <laughs> yeah. But it is, you know, that's exactly it. So that's cool. That was a cool conversation. Let's go. The same Carrie Hickman who sent in that photo asked to send in that question asked, Brendan, what is your most essential items in your backpack? <laughs> I feel like you I have mean, to say basically shoes. three. <laughs> I guess we know the essentials. But yeah, so I think the most important uh, for me would be uh, vessels, to, you know, um, containers for water. Uh -huh. um, otherwise, you have to stay very close to the water all the time. So as simple as it is, a plastic, a two-liter plastic bottle um, just allows you that freedom to explore or to move you know there's so you know there's so many limitations that would come in if uh you you had to lose your water container 
It happens on travel all the time. And people people love these hydration packs, these bladders. Uh, I don't like them because they're too many components, too many little things that can yeah, break. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like valves and seals and clips. And, and even if you take it out to go scoop water and you walk back, it can get punctured. Yes. So and then you don't have anything. Then you have nothing. So always have more than one container. So what do you use? Water bottles. Really? Yeah. Huh. Even just a, you know, there's nothing better than or cheaper than a, a you know, a, a plastic bottle yeah. like a Coke bottle or whatever. You know, okay. like if you're going to be doing it long term, obviously you, you don't want to be walking with that old bottle. So buy a, a, a proper, you know, BPA whatever yeah. you know mm. proper bottle, but have two of them, and, and um. Yeah, I, I just, th there's more that can go wrong with that yeah. mm. system. Um, and you have two bottles, and the only thing that can go wrong is the lid gets lost or something mm. like that. So, mm. most essential item for me, water containers. Cool. Yeah. Good answer. Uh, more than one, hey? Always more than one. I won't forget. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm definitely passing <laughs> that on. There's always so much pressure for to have the Osprey, the fan two and a half thousand rand bladder, and now uh, I'm going to be like, ah. No, a two liter Coke bottle. There you go. Exactly. That's the job. <laughs> now no it's one can judge me thing. when I'm saying this. I'll be like, I was told. It's <laughs> like the people at local <laughs> trails <laughs> recommend <laughs> this. That's why I'm using this. I'm actually. Ali, off the hip. Yo. What's your game drive drink of choice? <laughs> Gin and tonic. First Pe place. You would go right now on your bucket list. Absolutely anything is an option. Okavango Delta. Nice. Your favorite national park. Maybe I'm going back down the same road. Oh, I don't know. I, I don't want to answer that. Okay. <laughs> it's too many. <laughs> Taylor, favorite national park. Lower Zambezi National Park, Zambia. Why? Oh, because of the Zambezi River. I, I mean, everybody talks about mana pools and it's great and it's fantastic. And Ali and I have this arch rivalry because she's normally standing on the other side. One side of the river. Yeah, and I'm on the other. No, that happened once. I I'll tried to you. shout and the two of us together are quite loud. Um, but yeah, so I, I think the Lower Zambezi National Park is exactly like mana pools, but without the presence of so many people and and all the vehicles. Um, I mean, it's just over 400,000 hectares and I think now there's seven lodges just mm. in that national park mm. which is am amazing so the wildlife viewing might not be as great because the animals aren't as habituated but there's definitely so many leopards and elephants and 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 the, the river is just a fantastic component to it that's awesome that's cool so um, let me see here Brendan we've got a question from Mark Riddler Mark Riddle. Captain of yeah? the Rollers at one stage. You do know him. <laughs> he says, your best wilderness book for reading. Uh, I th uh, so, wilderness related. So, go back to Dr. Ian Player's uh, Zululand Wilderness, Shadow mm. and Soul. I think is a classic. I think a phenomenal... Sorry, I'm over you. Just say again the name. Shadow of the Soul. Uh, Zululand Wilderness, Shadow and Soul. Dr. Ian Player. It's a classic. I think if you want to dig a little bit deeper, not so much, uh, you know, trails related, but just in terms of ecosystems thinking, um, then Aldo Leopold's uh, Sand County Almanac is a nature classic. I think it's it's inspirational for any nature lover. So those are two books that I would sort of recommend. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for your wisdom. You've got one more trail in you with one wilderness guide. Again, from Mark Riddle, where would it be and with who? Jeez, that's an unfair question, hey? <laughs> I didn't make it up. Yeah, jeez. I don't know, you, you know, I almost feel like where, like every destination, there's a there's a different personality that, yes. that fits that. Um, but I think at, at this stage, I would like to do a Mpongol backpack trail with a guy called Donovan, Donovan to Blanche. I don't know if you know him from um, Kruger National Park. Just because of our history there, like when we first started, we did a, a, a few of the first backpack trails and, and I haven't walked with him in ages. And that would be a, a great trail. Very cool. Yeah. Very, very cool. Last one for you three in a row from Wildlife Lou. Also spent a lot of time in Zambia, he says, is your most memorable wildlife experience on foot and why? 
Um, I think most memorable experiences are often the ones that you that's not associated with that adrenaline rush or sighting and so forth. Um, but that's not a very exciting answer, is it? So. <laughs> Doesn't have uh, to be exciting. Your most memorable wildlife experience. Yeah. Up to you. Yeah. Jeez, that is uh, tremendous. Uh, I I think of. Jeez, I I think of uh, <laughs> a couple of close calls and things, and uh, think of a story of um, hippos. Uh, Hippos fighting outside. I have this written down. I wanted yeah, to ask you about it. Yeah, because that was that was in, that was just ridiculous. Yeah, it was. Yeah. I mean, I remember you telling me the story. Yeah. You want to go? Oh, good. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna continue with chatting with chatting to Brendan. I asked him, uh, "What's your most memorable wildlife experience on foot and why?" From my very good friend, wildlife Lou, who's in the UK now, but has spent loads of time in Zambia, Tanzania, and Kenya. And Brendan started mentioning something about a hippo. I had this written down before the interview, whether it was going to come up or not. But he has a good story. Yeah, it, it was it was memorable in that it was the most frightening experience. I've had another experience that didn't end well. It ended well for me, but um, that there was no time to be scared. <laughs> yeah. um, this was, you know, there was time to observe and analyze and speculate, and just it it wasn't. Yeah, it, it was actually a miracle that things turned out okay. So we were on this exact Mpungul River and we had we'd been camping I think it was the second night we had put up our we actually used tents. Um and it was in the middle of the night. Fortunately there was a big moon. But we just heard it it really was like a thunderstorm right outside the tent, but as like with an earthquake at the same time, you know? The ground was shaking. Big body blows, tusks smashing, but I, I had no idea w what it could be. So I thought black rhino, I thought elephant. Anyway, as I got out of my tent, there were two hippo bulls, three meters from the closest tent. Oh so goodness. literally there, um, I was peering over tents, guest tents, with the hippo standing there. It's four tons of animal, like just locked, jaws locked. And heavy breathing and gurgling and I was like this is ridiculous the mm. guests are trapped in the in the tents they're gonna be trampled anyway they started smashing each other they had no regard for the camp or trees bushes anyway they went this way that way and anyway, I managed to get out get the rifle the backup came and stood next to me and they turned and they started coming sort of the, the dominant bull at that point in time started pushing the other one back towards our camp and the backup rifle had climbed out of his tent and I said like look if that animal's foot touches your tent I'm going to shoot and I was aiming at the back of the animal's head for the brain shot but I realized that if I shoot my projectile is going to go through the head of the animal closest to me and into the animal behind him so I said look if I shoot immediately you have to shoot you know the animal behind because it's 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 a dangerous situation to leave that wounded wounded animal, but it's unethical as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, unfortunately, you'll have to finish what you start. And they kept coming, kept coming, kept coming, fighting, and um, it was literally a meter, we, a meter from the tent, three meters from us. We had both chambered our rifles. We were waiting. We were just waiting for the foot to touch the sheet, and we would have had to kill both animals right there. Um, and miraculously things turned and it went past the tent and they, they sort of rumbled off into the bush. Um, but the next morning it was ridiculous. I mean, there was, you know, frothy blood sprayed everywhere, gouge marks in the deep, you know, deep gouge marks in the hard earth. It was frightening. Yeah. It was frightening. And, you know, I observed it. We, as as rifle carrying team, observed it for about four or five minutes. It's a long time where yeah. hippo bulls are fighting, lifting each other, falling to the ground. I mean, if you guys have experienced that, that's... I'm already getting that's anxiety that's attacks. Power. <laughs> that's Terrified. power. And yeah. it's right there. It's right there. You just... So that was the most frightening and hence one of the more memorable experiences. <laughs> you don't forget that one. No, no. That, that's literally a terrifying story. I yeah. think of a tent. And it's not a tent. It's a small 
Tiny. one yeah. two man tent that people are carrying yeah. a hippo you got nowhere to go yeah it was it was very scary i really thought that someone was going to be trampled yeah honestly yeah. But yeah. that's why we roll in the bush with you. Man. <laughs> <laughs> never feel worried. I'm never walking again without Brendan. <laughs> and you can make fire from yeah. nothing. He's got all the skills. Yeah. <laughs> he does. So we're going to shoot some off the, off the bat again. Uh, Ali, favorite animal? Rhino. Awesome. I love it. Taylor, your spirit bird. And why? <laughs> From my friend in Chicago, Leslie Bennett. I was one. Oh, happy birthday! For, for, on Friday, yeah, hip hip hooray! Um, I was once described as a grey-crowned crane. I don't okay. know how I feel about that. I think it has something to do with my hair. Uh, <laughs> not a fan. It's a um, cool spirit bird. Though. <laughs> I don't know. I love a grey-crowned crane. If they'd said that they said I was a grey-crowned crane because of my sassiness and my attitude, then yeah. yes, maybe. But they, you know, they used my hair as an example. At this time, it was not Tristan calling me that. It was James <laughs> Henry. Um, I, I don't know. Or maybe it was Tristan. I would have gone for babbler for you. <laughs> yeah. Ah, yeah. Uh, says the Venezuelan uh, Italian. Okay. <laughs> We're in blocks. We know how Green to recognize each other. There, hey? <laughs> yeah. um, I, don't, I actually haven't got a clue, but it, it could be anything loud. So from a hardy to ibis, depending on how annoying you find me, <laughs> I suppose. Never a hardy to Taylor. Ah. I love it. Brendan, what's the rarest bird you have ever seen? It's from my friend Ali Edmund, sitting in Joburg. Um, yeah, I, I suppose rarities in, in, in South Africa, it would, would probably be traveling for the, for the green barbet, mm -hmm. you know, from a Southern African perspective, making a mission to go see that. Uh, very localized, you guys know, tiny population in the remnant forest. Um, so that's a memorable mission, um, one of the rarer birds I've seen, at least in the sub-region, yeah, in southern Africa. And uh, yeah. outside of that? You know, I'd, I, don't, I don't know what would qualify as the rarest, cool, to be cool. honest. Yeah, <laughs> a bird that immediately comes to mind, that's pretty cool. I mean, I think mm. of like, oof, I once saw Bartel Trogon in mm. Zambia, like sure, that comes nice. to mind. Yeah. But I mean, even, yeah, I don't know. Well, well, no, no, Rosses, like Tarakos. Okay, Rosses. Where yeah. did you see that? In, well, not that they're rare, but yes. they're incredible. Yes. Um, that was in Akigera. Awesome. Yeah, we so missed it in Uganda yeah. now on our trip. Um, yeah. That is cool. Beautiful very bird. Cool. Very, very cool. Rosses, Tarako. Taylor, is a zebra black with white stripes or white with black stripes? I don't know. I'm kind of blind. That's from again. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy with that answer. <laughs> I'm very proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to leave it there. Um, I promise I'm a professional safari guide. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to do one more serious one. And then we're going to probably finish off. Taylor, I listened to a podcast that you did um, called Escape oh, the Zoo. Oh, yeah. That was, wow, that was a long time ago. Yeah, but w there were a couple of fascinating things. But the one that was most fascinating for me was you talked about ADD. And oh. that it's like could be a ben it's a benefit to you in your in your career, uh, yeah. So I want you to tell us about that actually, so like because I think it's cool. You know that that you can associate that you've associated a positive with your unfounded energy. You know, and, and I think so. At school, I in order to pass school, I had to be on Ritalin and Concerta. I mean, we started on Ritalin and then found that Concerta was a better option for me. So I've done the ph pharmaceutical drugs and uh -huh. trying to concentrate. And I was, I was very disruptive. I was a nightmare. I wanted to be the class clown. And whether the teachers told me otherwise, I still did it. And I, I was a huge distraction to a lot of people. So that was not great. And unfortunately, when I was on this medication, it took my personality away. And I do, I do have a very big personality, I know this. And it's sometimes it's most of the time it's overbearing for overwhelming, sorry, for people. But, you know, it is what it is. We are who we are. And so school, I struggled and I swore that once I left school, I will never take Ritalin or Concerta ever again in my entire life. And I always wanted to become a safari guide. I wanted to be a whole bunch of things, but I kept coming back to becoming a safari guide. That's where I did my like my work experience. You know, you do in high school in South Africa. 
I went and stayed on a game reserve. And, he, you know, it was the best thing for me. I thought that I wouldn't do well. And I definitely was <laughs> very disruptive during my level one <laughs> guy training course. <laughs> Coming back at you, no, sorry. I'm an instructor. <laughs> oh, sorry, everyone. I mean, I'm still pretty distracting. It's a nightmare. I'm trying to work on it <laughs> at 27. <laughs> still trying to figure it out. Uh, so, um, what I, I have to practice self control all the time, which is probably the hardest thing for anybody with ADHD or ADD, attention def deficit disorder. You can have an argument whether you think it's real or not. I definitely have something different to other people uh, somewhere on mm. the spectrum. But being out in the bush and having so many things to keep my brain busy was the most important thing for me. So some people get me uh, ha meditate and sit quietly and don't speak and can do the whole heavy breathing thing. I can't because if someone breathes deeply near me, I want to have a heart attack and I'll, I, I can scream. Or if someone taps a pencil, I could lose my mind. But I can fixate on a colony of ants for two hours and not worry and just sit and watch them quietly and not say a word. But that's the only time you'll keep me quiet. So these small fascinations from a bird fluttering around in a tree or a solifuge digging out a burrow, it was just the most amazing distraction and I'm so fascinated by nature and being outside. So for someone like me who, and I've heard people say that if you do have ADHD or ADD, you, you typically think quite primitively and um, yeah, you don't, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that like I'm, I'm not, I'm very primitive and like I live in the bush with a lawyer class and, and that type of thing. <laughs> that's definitely not the case, but I don't know. I can focus on lots of different things all the time. So I can hear lions roaring in the distance, but I can also hear what my guests were saying right at the back and talk about what was happening and then quickly go into that question, even though they thought I maybe wasn't listening. Um, or, and I think that's why I was pretty good at doing the wild earth presenting safari type guiding which is obviously very different to the way that I actually guide in case you were wondering I don't talk that much but um yeah I could just go from one thing to another and I could have nothing in front of me but I'd always find something to talk about because I just feel like people with the, what we have see things that maybe other people don't see straight away mm -hmm. I think you learn it and you know how you go to the city and you come back and it takes a bit of time for your eyes and your ears to adjust to the natural sounds again I don't, I feel like I don't lose that. Even in the city, I can hear the baby crying to the dogs barking to some guy street racing on a motorbike in the distance. And all those sounds are registering as different things rather than one loud sound. So I don't know if that really makes sense, but the bush was honestly the best industry for me and I don't have to medicate, which for me was an absolute godsend. And I can have my personality and I can be loud and, 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 and. So I can just Thank put a, add there because you know what a lot of people with ADD or ADHD have is the ability to hyper focus so yeah. that's what you're talking yeah, about exactly. right there it's that hyper focus so that's a that's a superpower that no one else has Absolutely. so let's imagine ADD is the normal just think of how many people are, stra are suffering suffering from nature deficit disorder uh -huh. yeah. nice. so don't feel you know they like to flip it like ADD you yeah. odd one out Flip it. Say, I'm before, normal. Right, no, no. You guys are nature deficit disorder. Yeah. It's it's a reality, and that hyper focus is is something that um, the other people don't have. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. No, I've definitely found it hugely beneficial to my guiding career. Mm. It's definitely in school. Yes, it definitely hindered my performance because I didn't conform to the norm and I didn't fit into the square. That, which mm -hmm. is probably why I got into trouble at all the lodges I worked to because I just wouldn't. Because I thought my way was better. Yeah. Brendan, keep, keep, <laughs> so let's keep rolling like nature deficit disorder. We've come out of, you know, for some people has been the most anxious period, the scariest period of their entire existence on the planet. doesn't matter who they were. Um, what is nature deficit disorder? What is wilderness for you? And where do we need to be going? And then what, what is most important to you? Roll wherever you want with that. So I think there's one pivot point there, and that's ecology. So if you look at nature deficit disorder, it's a disconnect from ecology. Um, if you look at wilderness, it is most pristine ecological system. Pristine, like, as in heavenly, <laughs> to me. Yes. Um, and then then you know where what where should we be going with all of this uh ecology 
and and what is it like if you look at ecology what is ecology ecology is relationships that's what it is so very often what we do on or what we try to do on trail is to try and interpret ecology in a way that stimulates the reconnection um, to relationships so reconnect relationship is the relationship reconnecting with yourself reconnecting with the other and reconnecting with the environment so so i use ecology as the pivot so what do we need to do where are we going we need to reconnect guys um first with self then with other but then with nature we we have for too long seen seen ourselves a part of nature but we are a part of na- you know what i mean we are we are the hum- we the human expression of nature we the human animal and i think w- we don't like admitting that and hopefully this this period this 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 um shake up this wake up or whatever you want to call it maybe we'll start um you know help people reconnect reconnect to self reconnect to each other reconnect to the environment um so wilderness for me is that pristine um system where everything is connected and in balance and 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 we need that not just for you know that that in itself is the condition for life isn't it that's the be all and end all you take that away there's nothing okay but even beyond that it is it's essential it's critical for our sanity it's a condition for our sanity as a species as individuals as communities so yeah that that's that's best like the best i can answer it is it's all connected so at the center point is ecology what is ecology relationships we need to work on the relationships that's what we have to do i love it yeah and 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 brendan's one of the best facilitators of that and and and, you know i believe in that you guys have inspired me about those types of things and yeah if you want to go out and do it go with brendan and and yeah Yeah. as you say reconnect and it's beautiful you've written something also beautiful on ecology on linkedin there's an article and obviously the clip that that you've done so you could find all those on social media it's beautiful um ali uh, from Chad Golderman, also a good friend, guided EP, Elephant Plains in the Sobi Sandy City. As a young guide, what lesson has stuck with you till today? That's a very hard question. Or maybe just some inspiration for a young woman out there. Like, you can't, like or, or, what are your steps or what did you learn that helped you? She's always giving me Spanish lessons, so you must have oh something. You'll, you'll become a Spanish She's guide at one point. In Venezuela, we used to say. Cool. I think that perhaps is not being afraid of asking for help when you need mm. it because I, I think when you start being a guide everybody expects you to know everything and I think a lot of guides fall into the trap of either start lying or making up stuff or just winging things because they don't know how to do it but I found that if you've got the right mentors or if you're not afraid of going up to someone and being this happened to me today on a walk or I had this experience I'm not sure I handle it right what would you have done or whatever the case where I had this guest that said this or I think that helps a lot, not being afraid, because we can't be expected to know everything. You don't know any everything, so I think that that helps a lot. Just being, That's awesome. yeah, just being able to admit your own shortcomings, and not in a bad way, but just it's mm. the only way to get better. Never stop craving mentorship. I think a lot of guys yeah. do that when they think mm. that they've reached a certain point in their career, but you can you can never stop learning. Absolutely, no, that's very profound. I love it, Tricky. ladies and gentlemen. That's all the time we got. The sun has gone down. Thanks so much for your time. Like, I really, really appreciate it. It's awesome. I think we've had a cool conversation. So I hope everybody enjoyed Thank listening you. to it. Thank you for having us. That um, was great. Taylor and Ali, you can find them at Wandering Through, selling privately guided photographic safaris through Southern, Central, and East Africa. Find them all over the internet. There's also some funny videos of Taylor to be found out there. If you keep searching, search for <laughs> Taylor Falls in the Mud. And the gerbil sighting. That's by far my oh, favorite. God, oh, the gerbil. Oh, you are missing well, out. <laughs> Sounds dodgy. It is. No, it is. Google. It's <laughs> the gerbil sighting. It is dodgy and appropriate. It it's all the things. It's, awesome. it's wonderful. <laughs> Brendan Pinar, you can find local trails company all over the internet. Go check them out. Going to the bush with Thank you.
Awesome. Thank, Thank you for having us. Yeah. Anything else you guys want to say? We love cool. being Safari Guys. Can we do this again? Yes, that's what I want to do. I'm just looking forward to my ciggy, so if we can just wrap it up. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. You can find today's guests online via their social media handles linked in this podcast description. Go ahead and give them a follow, share some love, and show some support for what they are doing. We welcome your questions and comments and encourage you to let us know what you're thinking. Who do you want to meet around our campfire and what burning questions do you have for these bush legends? Find us on social media via the links in the description and tune in to watch our podcast recordings from around the campfire on our YouTube playlist.